Persia, Zoroaster. In the primitive dualistic world, the powers of light and darkness are worshipped alike. The equal strength of both good and evil may have arisen in the mind of man when he observed nature and meditated upon his own life. Man is inhabited by contradictory forces. In his thought and action, good and evil are so intimately mingled that he cannot always distinguish between them. Moreover, good intentions sometimes generate evil, or criminal desires become the servant of the good. Both principles seem to be everlasting, and in nature nothing carries out the idea that light should overcome darkness. In the East, good rain falls, fertilizing the land, while in the West, evil rain falls, causing destructive inundation. The South Wind carries pestilence and fever, whereas the North Wind cleanses the air and chases away disease. No wonder that primitive man discovers good and evil spirits everywhere. He calls upon them, flatters them, lies to them, and even uses every means which he deems fit to bring about good influences and to avert the evil ones. Out of fear he pays more respect to evil spirits. When the hunter's arrow fails his prey, such failure is rarely attributed to lack of skill, but rather to a nefarious intervention of evil. Little power is given to man in such a primitive world. With growing civilization, man became increasingly aware of his capacities and his responsibility. The Chaldean star religion taught that luck and disaster are no haphazard events depending on the caprices of spirits. Rather, they derive from the heavenly bodies which send good and bad according to mathematical laws. Man, it seemed, was incapable of fighting the will of the planet divinities. Yet the more this system evolved, the more did the wise men read ethical values into man's fate. The will of the stars was not completely independent from man's demeanor. His deeds were mysteriously linked with the happenings above, and they were of importance in the interplay between heaven and earth. In the 7th century BC, the king of Assyria, Ashurbanipal, sent his prayer to the star Sirius. Speak, and the gods may assist thee. Judge, give thine oracle. Accept the raising of my hand, hearken to my imprecation. Take away the enchantment, blot out my sin. A spell had been cast upon the ruler, who asked himself whether he deserved this misfortune, because he had committed a sin. The favor of the star is invoked to remove not only the spell, but its cause as well, the evil deed. And Sirius is addressed as the messenger of higher gods who assist him in this beneficent course, and whose will he announces. It was probably in Ashurbanipal's time that Zoroaster the Median prophet preached the doctrine that evil, though powerful and ever-present, can be avoided and lastly defeated. Zoroaster purified the ancient belief in the hosts of good and evil spirits, rulers of a split universe. He traced these legions back to their principles. Ormazd, Ahura Mazda, King of Light, Araman, Ahura Mainyu, Prince of Darkness. The good demons of older traditions were dethroned by Zoroaster. However, since they could not be eradicated from popular beliefs, they were granted a place in the hierarchy of evil spirits. Led by Araman, these spirits no longer oppose good in unruly swarms. The kingdom of evil has become organized like that of good. The two armies are marshaled in warlike array. As in the game of chess, whose white and black figures oppose each other in equal strength, the armies of light and of darkness face one another. Victory, however, is not followed by peace, because the struggle continues to the end of time. In heaven as on earth resounds the battle cry, Here Ormaz, there Araman. Six archdemons are Araman's principal underlings, corresponding to the six archangels surrounding the King of Light. These archangels are divine wisdom, righteousness, dominion, devotion, totality, and salvation. The archdemons are the spirits of anarchy, apostasy, presumption, destruction, decay, and fury. The last mentioned archdemon's name is Deva, known to the Hebrews as Ashmedai and to Christian demonologists as Asmodeus. 
The riddle of why this demon has attracted more interest in the Occident than other Zoroastrian devils is still unsolved. According to Pierre de Lancre, Asmodeus is the chief of the fourth hierarchy of evil demons, who are called the avengers of wickedness, crimes, and misdeeds. The learned Brabantian doctor John Weir gives, in his Pseudo-Monarchy of Demons, a curious description of Asmodeus. He is a great and powerful king. He appears with three heads, a bull's head, a human head, and a ram's head. He has goose feet and a snake's tail. He exhales fire and rides upon a dragon of hell. He carries a spear and a banner. Truly, the goose-footed fiend will give goose flesh to whoever calls upon him. Asmodeus is, however, not to be feared. Say to him, In truth, thou art Asmodeus, and he will give you a marvelous ring. He will teach you geometry, arithmetic, astronomy, and mechanics. When questioned, he will answer truthfully. He can render man invisible and reveal hidden treasures. Many other demons in the Zoroastrian religion, devas of lower rank, tempt one away from the true worship of Mazda. Paromite, arrogance, mitox, the falsely spoken word, zaurvan, deceptitude, akatasa, meddlesomeness, verino, lust. Still lower in this fiendish hierarchy rank the druges, the yatus, the nasus, enchantresses, malevolent beings, deceivers, and monsters. Just as great is the circle of heavenly legions, the good yazatas. So far it is only by its detailed organization that Zoroaster's dogma is distinguishable from that of primitive dualism. But the reformer's originality resides in something beyond his elaborate angelology and demonology. He conceived periods of time in which the fate of the material world and the good and bad principle would be decided. The outcome was to be good. Defeat awaited Ahriman. Zoroaster distinguishes between two types of time, boundless time or eternity, and sovereign time, a long period which Ormaz carved out from the immeasurable bulk of eternity. Sovereign time will last 12,000 years. It is divided into four cycles of 3,000. Each millennium is presided over by a sign of the zodiac, an indication that sovereign time is thought to be an enormous celestial year whose smallest fraction is the circle of twelve daily and nightly hours. Three, four, and twelve are the mystical numbers of this cycle. They are the base upon which evolves the number seven, the six archdemons together with Ahriman their ruler, and the six archangels with Ormazd. The first 3,000 years are those of spiritual creation, during which all creatures remain in their transcendental form. The second triad is that of material creation, of celestial beings, of spirits, sky, water, earth, plants, animals, and mankind. The third period is that of the eruption of the evil one, that dominated man's history before the coming of revelation. The last period that which started with the advent of Zoroaster will end with the Day of Judgment. Dualistic Zoroastrianism tended towards monotheism. Evil was originally thought to have sprung from a doubting thought of the good God. In later versions of the sacred scriptures, those accepted by the Zarvantine sect, there still exists a single power, whence sprang Ormazd and Ahriman, the ill-matched brothers. This single power is Zervan Akaran, boundless time, which rests in its glory, so incomprehensible to man that we can but honor it in awed silence. In this manner creation began. Acharan produced light by emanation. From light sprang Ormazd, the firstborn, who created the pure world. Then he ordered the hierarchy of angels and the myriad concepts of things he intended to bring into being. Another emanation of boundless time was Ahriman, second born of the Eternal, who was jealous and hungry for power. He envied Ormazd and was banished to the realm of darkness, where he is to reign in night while the struggle between good and evil is being fought. The war began thus. After a thousand years, Ormazd created light, patterned after the supermundane, the celestial light. He fashioned the source of life, a power he called Bull, and Ahriman destroyed the Bull-being. 
From its scattered seed, Ormaz then fashioned the first man and the first woman. With milk and fruit, Araman seduced the woman, and man fell into sin. And as evil counterparts of the good animals, Araman created harmful beasts, reptiles, and snakes, the craftstras. And the war goes on. The strength of evil grows overwhelming. Yet at the moment when Araman seems to triumph, redemption is at hand. Redemption awaits the day of judgment, the advent of the Savior, when a flood of molten metal shall sear the wicked, while the righteous shall pass unharmed. As good and evil are parted finally from one another, Ormazd will establish his good kingdom. The dead shall rise, and hell shall be purified and claimed for the enlargement of the regenerated world, deathless and everlasting. Zoroastrian thought has exerted a greater influence upon the Western world than many wish to believe. Though this religion is nearly extinct today, many of its ideas continue to live in Christian doctrine. A. V. William Jackson says that anyone who has even a superficial knowledge of the Iranian religion cannot but be struck by the parallel that may be drawn between it on the one hand and Judaism and Christianity on the other. He points out how intimately related in both types of religion are the doctrines of angels and demons, how the manifestations of the doctrine of a new kingdom, the coming of a savior, the belief in resurrection, a general judgment and a future life are almost identical in both dogmas, the Zoroastrian and the Christian. The question of who was the originator of these ideas has not yet been satisfactorily answered. We are inclined to believe, however, that most of these ideas germinated in an older tradition and were shaped by Zoroaster, whose teachings began to spread shortly before the Hebrews returned from their Babylonian exile. It must have been in Babylon that the Hebrew sages became acquainted with Zoroastrianism and incorporated some of its features into the older creed. There is also no doubt that the Gnostics accepted many Zoroastrian ideas, especially Hellenistic Gnosticism, which attempted to reconcile Greek thought with that of the Orient. Infinite light, by which deity is expressed, the doctrine of the all-powerful and the eternal word, by which Ormazd created the world, the emanation of divine light bringing forth the good, and numerous other features of Zoroastrianism lived on in more or less altered form among Gnostics and Neoplatonists. Mithraism and Manichaeism were offsprings of Zoroastrian religion. Even the Mohammedans, whose persecution caused the decay of the Zoroastrian creed, accepted some of its features. Today, about 200,000 Parsis in India and Persia still perform the magical rites prescribed in the holy books attributed to the Iranian prophet. Though practically extinct, the old doctrine sprang up anew in the Middle Ages. Towards the end of the 12th century, the dualistic creed of the Albigenses spread in France like wildfire. Though suppressed in a pitiless crusade, it lived on surreptitiously. Today, the people in Carcassonne and Albi sometimes tell you in dark words of the struggle still being waged between good and evil. Again and again, the dualism of old brought forth the fruit of a vanished civilization, comparable to the ancient grain found in the tombs of the pharaohs. Planted in the earth, they arise from the sleep of ages, and yield their long-delayed harvest. 